I'm Helen Trujillo Workman Mora, and I'm here at Alba Monta Cemetery today. And I'm here trying to talk about our friend, our great grand, great great grandfather, Lorenzo Trujillo. He had a good friend named Benjamin Wilson, and Benjamin Wilson had lost several of his horses to some of the wild, fierce Indians in the community. And many of the ranchos, they wanted Lorenzo and his sons to hire them to keep them away from stealing all their livestock and everything. And so he and Benjamin Wilson tried to go after some of the horses that had been stolen. And Benjamin Wilson had got shot in the shoulder by a poison arrow. And Lorenzo saved his life by sucking out the poison. And Benjamin Wilson, he ended up being the second mayor of Los Angeles, county supervisor of Los Angeles for several years. And he, Mount Wilson was named after him. And also, he ended up being the great grandfather of General George Patton. And this was one of Lorenzo's friends, which he called, they used to call him Don Benito. And also, too, I would like to talk about my Aunt Olive Trujillo. She lived in the community of Riverside most of her life. And she worked at the cemetery as president of the association or foundation. And many of the family members also worked here. She kept the history alive and helped Joyce Carter Vickery with the book Defending Eden. She gathered information, wrote letters. Things were so slow years ago without the internet. I have, she left me most of all the letters, pictures, legal documents, some artifacts. Plus she made about four donations already to the museum. And the things that she did leave me will eventually go there too. She had restaurants. The Old South Tea Room, I believe it was on 8th Street or 7th Street. My uncle Ted Trujillo had a Bedford's Furniture Store. I think it was on 9th Street. And many of the family members had businesses here for a long time in Riverside. My Aunt Olive's husband, John Blahovich, he worked at the Mission Inn for their barbecue days. He was an excellent cook and would do the deep pit barbecues for the Mission Inn and also the Santa Barbara festivals. She has worked so hard trying to keep the history alive and she wanted me to make sure that I carried on trying to educate the community on the history that's here being that most of the old timers have passed away. I know that they'll never get a chance to read all the books written about him, which are on sale at the San Bernardino Museum and the Riverside Museum. Bruce Harley was a friend of hers. Tom Patterson from the Riverside Press. And Joyce Carter Vickery. All of those letters and correspondence was given to me that I have while she was researching and trying to document everything for Joyce for the book Defending Eden. Many of the history stories about Lorenzo are even now on the internet, which has been a lot easier contacting through Ancestry.com or family tree. I did my DNA a while back and I have 916 cousins and I've only met five. And it's very interesting 
and it's nice to see all the cousins coming out for these events and so many people know all the history that we weren't aware of but these gatherings and bring them out and we're learning more history about the area how important the history is we need to preserve that it, we need to preserve the adobe this is history that is pre-Californian, pre-Riverside. What's interesting also is they came from New Mexico to California in the 18, early 1840s. After California became a state in 1850, they became citizens by treaty where their children were born just natural citizens of California. I thought that was so interesting to see. Not only that, Lorenzo, he fought under three flags. In the Treaty of Hidalgo, he was involved in that. He was taken prisoner, ended up in New Orleans, ended up coming back. He was a community leader. He ended up starting the first Catholic church, this side of Orange County. He ended up starting the first school. He ended up the first post office. But they even had a tax collector. And uh, he was just a, a community leader everybody respected. And I think for this reason is why those Spanish Trail asked him to be the guide for those Spanish Trail because of his experience from the 1841 trek that he made. And his wife was with him. Many of the women couldn't come on those Spanish Trail if they were pregnant. It was too hard of a journey. Covered wagons couldn't come through here. There was traces of them laying all over the place. They just had to come with the burros, with all the goods, and I walk most of the way. This is such an interesting story. I, I wish that somebody would make a documentary on it because I have so much history. I just cannot give it all to you without reading all of it. It's so much to memorize, but it's so beautiful. And the nice thing about it is when they came here, can you imagine, you know, New Mexico, it's very dry area. To come here to California and see how green the soil, oh my goodness. It probably had to be like Shangri-La or something to them, you know. So I can see why they brought so many people to start their lives here. It was a, a beautiful time back then to see all the beauty and the soil so good and the weather so good and their crops were just really flourishing and they didn't have much money they all helped each other in fact before the church was built they had an altar that they had to cover up with branches and things because the Indians would have cost the priests when they came here. Now these are the wild fierce ones. They had a lot of the Indian tribes here that were very nice, very good, great neighbors, great people. But there was a few of them that were a little wild and fierce. And these are the ones that would cause trouble, steal their horses and things like that. And uh, also there were so many of their livestock and horses stolen that as they went over the Cajon Pass they had to end up making a, a, a double brand. The owner's brand and the other brand was that they sold it so that they wouldn't think that they stole the horses because so many were being sold at that time. And it was so nice to see that, you know, Lugo was so good to have and hire them. And then when they had that little dispute, or I don't know what exactly happened, 
you know, then Bandini took over and gave them the 2,200 acres and they made Lorenzo the leader and had him divide up the different properties for the different families. My, um, they had the Adobe house and then they had Juan's Cantina next to it. And it was right on the border of Riverside and San Bernardino. So Riverside was dry, San Bernardino was wet. So they had a lot of dances there. And so they couldn't control, you know, what was going on there. In fact, my mom met my dad there. My dad and his family had come from Texas and they loved to dance. And they used to call them the dancing workers from Texas. And uh, so my mom, you know, was, that was her uncle's place, so it was okay for her to go there. And uh, that's where she met my dad. But also, too, I remember her telling me that she had a swing on one of the trees on the right side of the adobe, and she almost got bit by a snake there. And they used to play a lot of different games and marbles and things like that. And it just seems like a, a beautiful time to be raised compared to the way things are nowadays. And the history needs to be told, and there's so much more that I would have to read to you. But Lorenzo and his family, you know, they married into the Sepulveda family, the Rubidu family. And I could, I wish I could just memorize everything, because, like I said, I really believe a documentary should be done about the complete history. I have it written down, part of it, like nine pages, because I knew my kids would never read all their books, and I wanted them to know the history. And um, so that's what I'm doing now, is mostly just scanning everything and trying to get it out to the family so that everything can go to the museum eventually. And like I said, I have a lot of the legal papers uh, for the Trujillo Ditch and when the uh, adobe was sold. And um, it's just wonderful to meet so many relatives. And if Lenny Trujillo has been really instrumental in getting the family together through his research on Ancestry.com, I think he must have about 1,200, you know, relatives on there. And it was so good to meet him because we started getting the ball rolling between everybody. And like I said, we are now a nonprofit through the Spanish Town Heritage Foundation of Riverside. And I'm very happy that we have come so far. It was so hard for my Aunt Olive at that time to try to keep the history alive, gathered all together to help Joyce with the book. And uh, also, um, Mr. Patterson from the press would call her, ask her about information on the gold mines that the Trujillos used to work in, in Gavilan Hills and the Santa Rosa and the Good Hope Mine Company. There was three of them. And different Trujillos worked on them from time to time. Who knows, that might have been the gold coins that my aunt, my grandmother, great-grandmother of Pellegrina paid for the Trujillo Ditch. We don't know. And uh, we did have an exhibit opening at the museum in the 70s. And we had Spanish dancers, which was my two nieces and my daughter. And uh, my grandnephew, he cut the ribbon. Uh, Mondo Ramos Jr., his dad was a boxer. And they had the exhibit there with some of uh, the artifacts from my grandmother's family, Elois and Antonino Trujillo. And one was a big deed box, it was just so beautiful. And then like a watch lobe and uh, a couple other artifacts. And there was a sign in back of the artifacts in the window and it said, before Riverside, there was La Placita. And that was so pretty to see. So hopefully we can continue to keep having events like this. 
under, you know, of course, Spanish Town Heritage Foundation with Nancy and all the cousins getting together to help make all this possible. So I'm very happy that to be here today. And I, I thank everybody. Uh, and we got to keep it going. Got to keep it going.